Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. Welcome to Chamber Chats. I am the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. And this program is made possible through the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union. And I'd like to begin, as always, by acknowledging that I live and work in the ancestral territories of the Lekwungen speaking Coast Salish nations, the Songhees and the Esquimalt. And of course, they have lived here for millennia. All of us here are, are residents because we are descendants of immigrants who came to this region, or perhaps you're a first generation Canadian. And when someone comes to this country and comes to this region, they are often given support by an organization called the Intercultural Association. We want to talk about that as we get back to resuming immigration into this country. Jean McRae joins me today. She is the CEO of the Intercultural Association of Greater Victoria. Hi, Jean. Thanks for being here. Hi, Bruce. Thanks for having me. Let's do a little sort of a, a snapshot of what ICA is and what you do. Sure. Um, I will say that this is our 50th year of uh, operating in Victoria. We started out with Folkfest. Uh, many people remember that event, which was an attempt by the, the community organizations, the ethnic organizations in Victoria to uh, end racism. We, they thought if, if they shared who they were and their culture, that uh, that would put a stop to that. Unfortunately, that's not true. We're, so we're still working on that aspect. A few years later, uh, ICA started offering immigrant services. So that's what we do now. We offer, when newcomers come into the community, we help them, you know, figure out the ropes, how to navigate uh, Canadian systems, how to get around, you know, what's expected of them when they're looking for housing or, or uh, getting a job. So we run programs in those areas, you know, the sort of settlement information orientation, the, um, you know, helping people uh, find employment, helping them learn English and Canadian systems. And then we still do a lot of work around the area of uh, anti-racism and, and uh, building an inclusive and welcoming community for everybody. Yeah, the transition into Canadian life, uh, of course, will depend on where they come from and how much of a transition that is, depending on the culture they've left behind. So tell me some of the degrees of that. Well, uh, we, we see people who come in who are, you know, well-educated, who maybe were schooled in English um, or studied in English or, in, you know, so that, you know, then there's no problem with language, but they're still having to figure out Canadian systems. And anyone who goes anywhere and spends any time knows that things work differently in different countries. So there's that sort of level. And then we have people who maybe come in and they've had uh, very interrupted schooling, maybe no schooling. So people who come in at a very low literacy level, even in their first language. And so uh, for those people, it's going to be a bit of a longer journey to get to the place where they're able to work or just live in society, um, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, manage in English. So it, 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 there's really a wide array of people. Many immigrants who come in are well-educated and, and really well-prepared to start rather quickly in the job market. And then there's others who will take a longer time, but, you know, eventually they'll, they'll do all right too. Yeah. Workforce is such an important thing because immigration has been a major source of us uh, bolstering and maintaining our workforce level. And of course, through the pandemic, as we know, workforce has been a challenge. There are a lot of places that can't function at full capacity because they don't have employees. And when we talk about those folks coming here with the education they have, um, we've spoken through some other platforms as well about the recognition of the credentials they bring with them. Yeah. That can be a bit of a challenge, can't it? It can be a very big challenge. It's something that Canada really needs to grapple with. It's the system is uh, different in every province. It's different for different professions and different areas. And we've made some progress in credential recognition, but it's not enough. So, you know, we're still with situations where people really have the skills to do the job. And I think it's, it's one of the areas that Canada and the provinces really need to get their hands around so that we're not wasting those skills that come in and we're not left in a position where, where we're not able to take advantage of the skills that people bring with them. So it's a big issue and it's been a big issue for a very long time. Yeah, a very well used story is the, is the old story of, of a doctor driving a cab for a living because mm -hmm. they can't get their credentials recognized. And I guess maybe some of the, the misalignment, if you will, Jeannie, is that immigration is a federal matter, but the recognition of those credentials is done on a provincial level, province by province. And yeah. it's my understanding that BC is one of the more challenging provinces for that to happen. Well, I think they're all challenging in different areas, but there's certainly some provinces who have, you know, I'm just going to take uh, the medical field as an example. When a doctor 
uh, comes in for, for provinces that have had a longer crisis in terms of not being able to attract uh, doctors and uh, keep them. They've, they've tried to really find some easier ways than having people go back to writing exams that they wrote when they left medical school and having to do a residency when residencies are really um, held. The, the ability to assign residencies is with the organizations that are training doctors. So naturally, they're going to go to their students first. They're not going to come to newcomers who may be well prepared to, to uh, move into the uh, into the area and really just need more of an orientation to how our systems work. How do you order a test? Where do you go? You know, are there different expectations in terms of ref referring to hospitals, other things like that. So, you know, those are things that um, we really need to move forward on. And we've got a big crisis in the medical field for sure, among others, but uh, yeah. yeah. It's my understanding engineering is also a difficult one to navigate. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah, we as a sector, we've worked with the with the College of Engineers for a number of years, and they've found some things, you know, some ways to navigate a bit more easily, but none of it's quick. So. Yeah, the uh, we should point out this isn't the provincial government necessarily to blame for this either. It's the professional yeah. associations and things, uh, as you mentioned that. But when we look at things like the building trades right now are crying for people, and it could yeah. be that building codes and standards are different from country to country or province to province, or for that matter, municipality to municipality. But, you know, if you're a drywaller, you're a drywaller. If you're an electrician, you're an electrician. There has to be a way to standardize that. What do yeah. you think can be done to make that happen? Well, I think, you know, we need to work with the trades. I think at some level, it may be that it needs to be the provincial government that takes control of the credentialing of people. Because right now, you know, some people would characterize it as a bit of a closed shop and a bit protectionist in terms of who comes into the into the circle of people who are certified to work. So. Um, I think it may be something that um, maybe that's the only way is if it's taken into the hand of a more neutral body like the provincial government. It doesn't mean they wouldn't have expertise and standards and other things, but um, just to try and move it along more quickly than what's happening because there's a huge need. We hear it from employers all the time. Yeah. Uh, the chamber has made a point of saying that maybe that needs to be standardized across the country too. So yeah. we're kind of working on that. Who funds what you do? Where does the money come from for you to do this important work you do? Well, we, we're, we're, our biggest funder is the federal government. So Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. And they, you know they fund our big settlement programs, our language programs, and um, some employment programs as well as um, you know, some other work that we do. So they're our biggest funder. The provincial government funds us for a number of different programs, primarily, although not exclusively, in the area of, uh, of employment and helping people get connected with the labor market. And then we have funding from various foundations, the Victoria Foundation, the United Way have funded a lot of good work that we've been doing in the community in, in terms of helping us uh, build that uh, more welcoming community for people. And then, of course, we fundraise for certain programs. Like, um, uh, you know, we, we have a lot more refugees coming in now than we did, you know, five years ago. And uh, there's some higher needs. So we do a lot of fundraising for those kinds of programs as well. Yeah, I want to pick up on what you just said about that there's immigration and there's refugees. Next, I want to talk about the difference between those two. Our guest on Chamber Chats today is Jean McRae. She is the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the Victoria Intercultural Association. Uh, and Jean, we talked, to, there's immigration and there are people that come here as refugees. So let's talk about the difference in that. They, they kind of seem the same, but they're not. Yeah, I mean, there's some, you, you could say that everybody is an immigrant. Right. But within the class of immigrants, there is a particular class that is refugees. So the refugees are the people who are fleeing their country for various reasons, for, for persecution reasons. You know, we have a number of people who come because they're in their LGBTQ plus and they're persecuted where they are and it's not safe for them to be there. So they have left their country and they've made a, a refugee application. We have people, you know, for political reasons, you know, the, the Syrians people were very familiar with, you know, the, the catastrophe that was happening in Syria. Um, we have, we are expecting, although we haven't received yet, some people coming out of the Afghan movement, the special initiative. Um, we, we expect to see people coming in the new year. Uh, but those are people like they, they really can't go back to their homeland because of the situation. 
for immigrants, more generally, people come either as sponsored refugees, as you know, my mother came for love, she married a Canadian, and so she came. And that happens still all over the place. Uh, but, you know, it's also people who, you know, who are skilled immigrants who are qualified based on a sort of point system that assigns them, you know, points for their education, for their language skills, for the particular um, area of work that they're doing so a lot of immigrants come through that uh, skilled worker scheme and you know so what they have that's different than refugees is that they're not they're coming of their own volition really you know they, they can stay home if they want to and and work there or they're choosing Canada as a place to come um, so that they can advance their career or better their life or other things but yeah, and for refugees, it's a bit of a different situation, as I've said. Yeah, and there are uh, quota numbers in place for both, I believe, right? Yeah, and and those numbers, you know, Canada, and we just heard yesterday in the throne speech, has reiterated their commitment to increase the numbers because what people don't understand is everybody in the, who is uh, capable of working is working in Canada the only labor force growth that will happen is through immigration. So the targets for immigration were elevated uh, prior to COVID. And then with COVID holding back arrivals, it's meant that those, those numbers are up again. So th they're very ambitious targets for immigration over the next uh, three years. And we'll hear more you know, probably in a few weeks about what those targets look like going forward. So then the real challenge will be getting the system to work quickly enough that it can respond to the needs that employers have. Yeah, we can, we can all trace our roots back unless we're an indigenous person, which I'm not. I'm, I'm ancestor. My ancestors are Irish and came to Canada in the 1840s originally. So that's the lineage that we can all look back on. So there's a term, there's immigrate and there's emigrate. What are the differences? What, what do those two things mean? Immigrate is when you're coming in. Yeah. Emigrate is when you're leaving. Okay. So, you know, your forebears left Ireland, they emigrated, but they emigrated to Canada. Yeah. Okay. So um, in a regular sort of a non-COVID, non-pandemic year, how many people does ICA work with? We typically work with between, uh, well, it's about 2,700 people. And the number goes up and down a little bit. And we're still working with that many people, even with COVID on where, you know, we're an essential service. So, you know, people... Um, are really uh, looking to us for a lot of support and, and COVID has affected people as well. So yeah. it hasn't really slowed down our business at all. No, I'm sure. Um, I don't want to ask for an average age because that doesn't really take into consideration the breadth of the age groups that are coming to this country, but can you break it down for me a little bit? Demogra how many are children? How many are young adults? How many are middle-aged? How many are seniors? Yeah. In, in the refugee population, population is a little different than, um, than the, the regular stream. So there we tend to see more children. So we'll see, um, you know, maybe it's not quite 50%, but you know, in some cases it is that high, about 50% children and, and uh, then adults and older adults. Uh, generally speaking, immigrants who come in are younger than the Canadian population. Um, so we tend to see people, you know, in the working age group, skewing a little bit to the younger end of the working age group with with uh, family immigration. There is family class immigration. People come to join, you know, their family here and maybe it's grandparents who are coming. So in that case, but it's not a huge number, you know, it's a smaller number. So that's one of the reasons why immigration is important, you know, that, that it does help us have a a younger population than if no immigration happened, we would have in Canada. Yeah. I have to think that a lot of the refugees when they show up are terrified. They're leaving terror behind. They're leaving a very bad situation. So on top of it being a new country and all of that cultural orientation that has to happen, there's some other issues in play there. Absolutely. And, and we've worked really hard to, to um, try and understand how to how to serve in a trauma-informed kind of way so that we're aware of what, what might be going on with people. And there is an organization that, that, that formed on the island. You know, they've been growing and they've grown quite a bit um, since the Syrian arrivals that does counseling. So we're really happy to have that service. And 
one of the you know sort of unintended consequences well, maybe all the kind everything's unintended with COVID, but uh, is that uh, they're able to off offer their services and reach out a little further because they can do it virtually. So you know, that's been good. Yeah. So we've been almost two years without immigration happening in a big way. So we've got some pent up demand. I want to talk about that next. Jean McRae is our guest today on Chamber Chats. She is the CEO of the Intercultural Association of Greater Victoria, the organization that helps people uh, adjust to life in Canada when they come here from somewhere else. Where are they coming from? Where are the, the, the countries with the most immigration into Canada? Where are they coming from? Well, it, it, we, we're looking at uh, Asian countries um, would probably be the biggest source. And, and currently we're seeing, you know, from from uh, the Middle East area, so with refugee populations, but others as well. So those are increasing. We've always had, on this uh, part of Canada that we're in, we've always had a good flow. And I think the biggest group for our area is people from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, and we see a lot that are going into really important uh, essential positions in healthcare and other areas. Um, we see people from uh, India, as well um, we're expanding a little for a long time that was mostly people from the the uh, northern uh, Punjab area of India but you know we're seeing a, a greater diversity of people arriving now from other parts of uh, the Indian subcontinent and um, smaller numbers for us are people from uh, African countries in the refugee population you know they're a little more highly represented and we're seeing more in the immigration streams but it's still a fairly small number from us and Latin America as well. Um, again, we're seeing people who are coming from, you know, Mexico and Colombia and other, there's been some refugee flows from, from Latin America, but there's also regular immigration. Yeah. My partner, Amanda, actually is African. So she came from Africa. You just you don't have to look too far to find people with really interesting stories yeah. as to how they ended up here. But you look yeah. back on the, on the immigration, even in the post-war years, uh, first war and second war that, um, you know, humongous number of uh, Ukrainians came to Canada and Polish and Italian, and they brought their skills with them. And that's what enriches our country because they bring elements of their culture, but they bring those skills along too. And that's what, that's what kind of helps us adjust. So what's, what sort of pent up activity is happening right now? How, what's, when the doors actually finally reopen, what's yeah. going to happen? What's that look like? Well, people have been coming in. We've started to see people coming in, uh, you you know, given travel restrictions and other things and testing requirements and all of those things. But, you know, we're, we are, um, if the immigration target last year was just shy of 400,000 people, well, 400,000 people didn't come in. Right. So, you know, there was some came, but certainly not the full amount. So we're just, you know, and as things open up, we're, we're excited, but we don't really know when. Yeah. You know, we're, we're the dark like everybody else. I guess another question relative to that that relates to everything else going on in this economy and in our community, where are they going to live? That is a big question. And, um, you know, we are definitely grappling with that question like everybody else. It's a really, it's a, it's a huge problem. It's a big problem for our labor force when we can't attract people regardless of where they're coming from and make sure they're housed in a, in a in a reasonably uh, costed way. I mean, it's just so expensive. And we know that for our own children too, you know, they'll leave if they can't find a place to live. So it's a huge uh, problem that we have to deal with as a society in all levels of government and um, members of the community as well. So it, it's a... <sighs> It's such a complex question, but yeah. it's also something that we need to deal with. The longer we put off really um, taking action on this in a meaningful way, it's not going to get any better. It's just going to get worse. Yeah, and well, nobody wants to see, you know, nobody wants anybody to be homeless in our society. That doesn't help any of us move forward. No, exactly. And immigration might be an accelerant to get some of those housing solutions in place too. Yeah. I had an opportunity. Or it could, sorry, Bruce, I'll just yeah. interrupt and say, or the lack of housing across the country could be something that limits our ability to bring in immigrants. And then that will in turn have huge effects on the labor market and, and uh, Canada's prosperity as a whole. Yeah. 
I had an opportunity to work with some companies who, uh, who were owned and operated by people who were not Caucasian, who made the decision to come to Canada because when Donald Trump was elected president, they didn't feel safe anymore in the United States. Have you seen much of that? We've seen, certainly seen some of that. We've heard, of, you know, initially when, when uh, Donald Trump was elected, we had a lot of inquiries from people about how do we, how do we immigrate? So, um, you know, definitely people have, have moved. Yeah. And, uh, and we still see people who would like to. I think COVID has also been another one where people have felt that maybe Canada's handled it a little bit better than, than uh, our neighbors to the South. Yeah. So. So we talk about all the services that you provide and the offers that you make to to engage people to get them as a part of, of Canadian culture and island culture, for that matter. Mm-hmm. So the people that are watching this or listening to this, what can we do to help ICA do what you do? Well, one of the things goes to that housing. If you have any, any openings, anything that would be helpful for us to help house people, that would be greatly appreciated. We really need that. Um, one of the things that ICA does, which I didn't mention, is that we are a sponsorship, a sponsorship agreement holder, which means we work with uh, constituent groups, volunteer groups in the community that come together to sponsor refugees from overseas. Um, there is such a need that the refugee population around the world is unfortunately expanding. And uh, I think you know climate change and other things will have an effect on that. And so everything we can do to help uh, people uh, escape untenable situations we can do, and people can help us with that by, by helping either donating to the private sponsorship of refugees or by working together with a group of uh, whoever it is, family members or others. We have a lot of people coming to us who live in this community, who know people uh, in their home countries who they would like to bring to safety. So we would very much appreciate any help in that way. And of course, with employers, please do get in touch with our employment uh, programming because we have good people and, um, you know, we'd, we hope we'll have more soon Yeah, who can help fill some of the gaps. Yeah. Well, you yeah. do amazing, you, you amazing work at your organization. And when immigration comes back, it brings strength to our communities. It brings diversity. Uh, it brings cultural enrichment. It's it's amazing what happens, and you guys do such a great job at it. Jean McRae is the CEO of the Intercultural Association of Greater Victoria and a member in good standing of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Jean, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. And that's it. We'll see you again for another Chamber Chats. Mm-hmm.